and welcome back. Yes, we're back to flashing LEDs on my workbench. What on earth is going on? I'm sure you're thinking, Bacon, what are you doing? Have we moved beyond flashing LEDs? And the answer is, there's a very, very good reason why I'm using LEDs, because it's a visual indication of what's happening behind the scenes. And no, we're not just flashing three LEDs for the sake of it. We're talking about timer interrupts today. And there's a sort of a long and convoluted story about why I'm showing you that. Um, basically, it's all back down to do with my web radio. I try to use the same technique for playing the music, failed miserably, and I'll tell you why a bit later on. So I thought, you know, this is still a very useful feature of the Arduino chip, the 328P. So why on earth haven't I told you about it before? So here we go. What do we mean by timer interrupts? Well, let me get the whiteboard out just a little bit, just for a minute or two, just to show you what I mean by that. And then we'll come back to a simpler version of what's running here. Right, back soon. Let's have a shout out for PCB Way. Now they're having their PCB Way big sale for Christmas 2020. As you can see here, they're having a shopping festival and yes, you can win lots of coupons. You can see what PCB Way does with all its thousands of users and daily processes very nicely here. And there's a lucky draw. Just press the start button and see what you can win. And they have a big year end sale. Big discounts up to 15%. Click the quote now button to see what you get. Oh, and look, you can now get buried or blind vias in multi-layer PCBs. If you know what they are, you know why you want them. And you can see here many, many projects that people have made for Christmas. Go in and have a look. And apart from all the festive Christmas cheer, you can still get your SMT order for just $30, which includes free shipping. Great. Why don't you try them out now? Right, let's get on with that whiteboard now, shall we? So what do we mean by timer interrupts exactly? Well, let's think about a standard uh, Arduino program where you have a setup and a loop. The setup runs once, doesn't it? And then the loop runs forever. Just keeps going around doing the same old stuff. Except if we have a timer interrupt, this is a hardware interrupt. And if a condition is met, this loop stops. And the other bit of code that we've said, this is my interrupt service routine will run next. And when that finishes, it just ends and stops. The loop then continues. It's, it's a little bit like when the Arduino goes to sleep. It'll just stop and then continue from where it left off. Well, same with the interrupt service routine. The loop st stops here, goes into this point here, runs this, comes out, and carries on back here. And of course, you can have more than one interrupt service routine. You can have several. The thing to remember is this has priority. When a timer interrupt is triggered, it's a hardware timer interrupt, this runs at the expense of the loop because the Arduino has only got a single core, it's only got a single thread, and it'll either run this or it'll run this, not both together. So we have to watch what we do with this. And that basically is how simple timer interrupts work. Now you can, there are three timers on the Arduino, timer zero, timer one, and timer two. For this particular purpose, we're using timer two because it tends to be the most available timer. It's only 8-bit though, so unfortunately it gets triggered a lot. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so now we have a sort of a general idea of what a timer interrupt is trying to do, and I've got a simpler version to the one that I showed you a few minutes ago. This is just flashing a single LED to prove the point. So let's have a look at the code behind it. Now the code is AVR. C++, it's not friendly Arduino speak because there is no friendly Arduino speak to do this. Uh, to be quite honest, I'm rather surprised that nobody's actually created a bit of Arduino speak to enable beginners to get a handle on to timer interrupts and timers generally. But here we go. All right, hang on to your, on to your hats. Let's dive straight in to the code. Okay, this is the code running. Now, yes, this is in my Eclipse IDE, but um, I've also got it working in the Arduino. No trouble at all. It is proper Arduino IDE compatible code. So let's just whiz through this. Now, as you saw from the, the um, whiteboard, the timer register uh, determines exactly what's going on with that timer. So what um, I've got some documentation here. You can see all this, uh, how we divide the 16 megahertz clock down by setting various bits. In fact, these bits here, look, CS20, 21, and 22 in TTCR2B, that's Timer Counter Control Register 2, uh, B, all right? Um, now, there's a number of ways we can, we can set that value. That's probably the easiest to understand because we're looking at each individual bit. 
Um, and it's well, it's it's pretty straightforward. What, what's that? CS22. Yeah, okay. Clock source uh, 22, clock source 21, clock source 20. They're the three bits of a particular um, register. So let's have a look at um, somebody who is not related to me, regardless of what his name is. It's good old Nick Gammon. So here you see a page from uh, Nick Gammon's website all about timer 2. And, um, well, the bit we're interested in, look, are these three bits here at the end. And they're called CS22, CS21 and CS20, clock source 20, 21, so on. And it's all part of TCCC R2B, timer counter control register 2B. All right. And uh, yeah, I know these, these names are somewhat esoteric, but there is no friendly name, as I say, in the Arduino language of this. I'm guessing Arduino themselves thought, you know what, if you get to this stage, you're obviously beyond Arduino speak, so we'll just leave it as is. Either that, or they just ran out of time, money, and um, impetus in doing it, which is probably more likely, isn't it? But this this page tells you everything you need to know about timer two. And yes, there is timer zero and timer one as well, but we're just going to quietly ignore those for a bit. Timer zero, you definitely don't want to muck about with, because timer zero controls things like millis, right? Which is very useful for well, timing things really, right? Make creating state machines and so forth, which we're talking about as part of this. Timer one is a 16-bit timer, so you can count for far longer. And um, timer two is a standard 8-bit timer, just like timer zero, which is the one we're using today, because as far as I know, we're not using it for anything else. But other things might, like, for example, tone libraries might use timer two, because after all, it's the one that's available for you. So people who write libraries out there tend to use timer two and if you think oh I'll just use timer two for this project I'm working on and you've already got a few chirps and whistles and bells and whatever added onto your project you might find that you're out of luck it's already been used anyway back to the code okay so what we said was we're going to set these three bits here in this register according to this divide by or prescalar value right now obviously i want this to be as slow as possible because we want to see things if we just go back to the the workbench that led there which yes it is synchronized with this because it's using the same pin um, is flashing at a rate you can see it if i hadn't slowed the whole thing down it just be it would look as though it's on all the time you might just see a almost imperceptible flicker because it is after all turning on and off about uh, 16,000 times a second all right so let's um let's uh, carry on with the code so we're saying divide the 16 megahertz clock from your arduino board um, by 1024 it's this one here right to give us this 15.625 kilohertz signal, which, as I say, is, is too fast to see normally. So I've done some jiggery pokery on my board deliberately just to show you. Now, there are various ways to set the register, and we've covered this in other videos, and I'll just give you the options here to see which way you might like best. And there's no right way, there's no wrong way. This is the way that's probably the most common, though, where you're actually calling the bits themselves, the name that have been given, by Arduino and which you saw in uh, Nick Gammon's uh, cheat sheet there. You could of course just put a, a basic binary value in there to say this register I want ORed with this value which means the first few bits this one here it will leave alone because we are ORing it here but the last three we are setting so that's doing the same job as this line here or you can say rather than using this one shift shift left shift right whatever it's going the bit value i want set is the one here and the bit value here is the one i set. it's six of one half a dozen the other whatever works for you works for you okay now with the timer controller you really need to set all the values first and then the data sheet says now set your pin mode that you want to change stuff to make the interrupt do things with once you've previously set everything do not set this first don't know why it's one of those little glitches little gotchas that probably have some undefined behavior that probably works most of the time but occasionally doesn't and then you'll be left there scratching your head going i don't know why this doesn't work okay right so that's what we're, all we're doing in this bit here is saying to the timer timer two eight bit timer divide the 16 million 16 megahertz clock signal that you're receiving by 
the value we've put in here, which is 1024, right? Okay, that's all it does. The loop here is simply printing out this number you're seeing here just to prove that it can do some work, but it has absolutely zero impact on the timer interrupt. What's that? Yes, John, you're at the back. What's, what's your question? Time it, yeah, time it interrupt. We're coming to that. These are specially named functions that the compiler recognizes as being an interrupt function. And uh, well, it looks like this. Look, we call it ISR, interrupt service routine, and it's for timer two overflow vector. All right. It's <laughs> Yeah, I know, technical names. It's done to confuse people. Well, not you now, because you know all about it, don't you? So you can confuse other people. Fine. OK. So this interrupt routine is going to be called when the timer overflows. So the timer, 8-bit. What's the maximum it can go up to? You at the back? Yeah, 255. Correct. So the clock signal is being read by the timer to... 16 million pulses a second, right? But we're saying divide that by 1,024. So 15,000 times a second now, this is going to be called. Yeah, I know, it's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot to get your head around how quick things happen in hardware. So what I've done also here is a little tiny bit of code to say slow things down a bit. In fact, all this does is slow it down by half. I could have probably got away with not putting any slowdown in here. Um, but you'll see in the next sketch that we most definitely do need some slowdowns. So all we're doing here is saying toggle pin what we call in Arduino world GPIO 13 yeah, or D13, I think we also say. Um, but uh, we have to say in Arduino speak, set the pin on the port that controls D13 on or in fact toggle it. If it's on, turn it off. If it's off, turn it on. Okay. And that's what this does. And why is it pin BB5? Well, we're looking at a port. A port is a collection of eight pins scattered around the um, Arduino, normally clumped together, port B and D. But we're talking about port B and we're saying port B bit 5. All right. So that's the detail. We're saying, yeah, it's D13, physical pin 19. Not that we really care about physical pins, unless you've got this on a breadboard and you need to know which one you need to attach things to. And it just toggles it here. So 13 or no, 15,000 times a second, this is being called. And I'm saying half that time, but then I'm doing something different just for the purposes of this demo. If we go back to the workbench, we can see this is not being called 15,000 times a second, or even half that, 7,000 times a second. It's it's probably about twice a second, isn't it? Why? Well, I've put the bootloader on here. I've changed the flags, the, the fuses right, on here to say, do not use this crystal at all. Use the internal oscillator for one megahertz. So it's running 16 times slower than it would do normally. Okay. And of course, you can do this with your AT Mega 328P on a breadboard. You can make it run on the internal clock. We've covered all that in previous videos. There, look, there's that. We covered it in that, for example. And it uh, means you can run without a crystal for battery operated stuff, you know, that turns on and off, then gets into deep sleep. Fine. So, as it happens, this particular board is currently not using that crystal down there at all. It's using its own internal clock. But I'm only doing that for the purposes of this demonstration. If I didn't do it that way, this would be flashing on and off so fast, it would be a pointless exercise. You would never be able to see this thing flashing. Right, back to the code. As you can see, this all this does then is toggle that pin so you can see what's going on. If we look at the loop, though, the loop is simply saying, add one to a big, long, unsigned integer and uh, print it out over here. And that's what it's doing. And it's not being affected by this bit of code here being called x times a second right it's just it's just totally independent so let's go back now why i'm showing this or what triggered my thought process showing this because i wanted to use this sort of feature a timer interrupt to run a bit of code every so often on my esp32 web radio i thought i know what i can do i can use the timer interrupt just the same way i'm doing it here and i can say every millisecond call the bit of code 
that pumps data out to my VS1053 MP3 decoder. Great, and it will run that, run a bit of music, stop, and then the timer will once again come in and say, go and do your stuff. Except what I forgot and what I was rudely uh, reminded of was that the ESP32 is not a dumb piece of hardware like this one. Sorry, no offense, Arduino. I wasn't dissing you, really. In this bit of code that you're looking at on the screen, if you were to put a long running process here, it would just run that long process no matter how long it took. Yeah, it would. But while it's doing that, of course, it wouldn't be doing this. It only does one thing at a time, after all. And whilst it looks like we're doing two things here, what's happening is that this counter is running and 15,000 times a second, if I hadn't put the delay in and all that, it would come down here, run this little bit of code, come back out and then carry on with this. So you can see that if this takes, I don't know, a millisecond to run, which is quite a long time, it would have no impact on the loop. But if you put something in this timer interrupt that takes, say, five seconds, then it would most certainly impact the loop. Definitely, right? Your loop stops, basically, whilst the interrupt runs and then resumes once the interrupt is finished. On the ESP32, because it's not just a dumb piece of hardware that does what you tell it, there's the operating system, the RTOS operating system, watching what's going on. So when my timer interrupt was running to say, go and put some music into the VS1053, please, and play that music, there's a watchdog watching me to see what's happening with this interrupt. And the minute you go over something like 300 milliseconds, it goes, oi, you've been running too long, I'm rebooting. So sometimes on the ESP32 web radio project, it would run and it would run and it would run after about 20 seconds and then go, no, you've run too long now, kaboom. And it would reset, which made me think about, hmm, I've got to do that a different way, which is why I put that into a task, right? Fine. And it's been running fine ever since. On the Arduino though, you'll get away. And if you did think this interrupt that I'm running here every so often, yeah, regularly is more important than the stuff I'm doing in the loop, then you can put whatever you like down here. Normally, though, you tend to put stuff down here that's either very quick or that sets a flag, a volatile variable, that the loop can then read and go, oh, I've got some work to do now because you've set a particular flag. I'll go and do that as part of an if condition, but I won't do it normally because that takes too much time to keep constantly checking a particular variable. I don't need to check it unless it's, it gets set by an interrupt routine like this. Here, though, we're just toggling a pin, which is very, very quick, especially when we're doing it like this, much quicker than doing a digital write to that pin. And as I say, I'm even slowing things down here. Basically, it has to count this delay up until it hits one, then it resets it and does the business. But that's purely for demo purposes. But it does also give you an indication that you can do a bit more in the interrupt routine. Okay, that's all there is to that bit of code. And there's lots of documentation up here, a um, bit of initialization and things, how to enable the timer and things. But I'll let you read that in your own time. The most important thing is this bit here, where you tell the timer how often you want it to run how often you need to divide by here. So we're divided by 1024 just to get the thing to slow down, but you could do it, you know, divide by 32 and then the thing will run at 500,000 times a second. It's a lot, but what you consider a lot, the hardware does not. A millisecond in the Arduino terms is an eternity. Okay, that's one thing we can do then with timers. Is there anything else? Right, so back to the workbench, you now see three LEDs, well, just about see, I think with this light, if I shield, you will see that the three LEDs are going on and off at different rates. So the green one's flashing quicker, then you get the, the yellow one, and the red one's probably slowest of all, I think, in this case. And yes, it's all still in slow motion, deliberately for this demo, because I've got this board running at one megahertz, not 16 megahertz, right? So it's 16 times slower than it would be, just so that we can see things flashing. Otherwise, it's all a bit too quick. Even the humble 80 mega 328p is a very fast chip. Yeah, can do a lot of work in that time. So what's different about this sketch then than the previous one we just saw? Let's have a quick look. Right, this is the upgraded sketch, right? Still using timer two, still using the overflow feature, right? The interrupt on the overflow, but we can do two other things. We can have two comparisons with a known value. 
So as well as the overflow now, I'm saying by setting these two values as part of the timer control to say, I want you to compare the timer value as you're counting up to 255, these two values down here. So 42, the meaning of life, universe and everything, and 99, probably my IQ or something. Yeah, no, I'm not, not that bright. So when it hits those two values, it will trigger two different interrupt service routines. One for um, OCR2A, so the comparator 2A, and one 2B. Right? And apart from that, very little has changed. So if we just scroll down a bit, we can see that the divide by is exactly the same. I haven't changed any of that. All right, so we're still dividing by 1024. Yes, all right. Well, shh. Forget about the fact we're not running at 16 megahertz. Let's pretend we do. Um, now here, previously we had pin mode 13 output. But just in the interests of talking in AVR C++ rather than Arduino speak, instead of setting all three pins now like that, because we're using three different uh, routines for three different LEDs, we can do it like this. And we covered all this in a previous video. There it is, that one there, You're all about Arduino speak. Data direction register B for port B, which is the eight pins that make up port B. Luckily for us, 13, 10 and 8, all part of port B. We're not using some that are part of a different port. And uh, we can say, well, the first two bits do not control any pins because 13 is the highest digital pin. 14, 15 are controlled by a different register. So they do nothing. But we can say pin 13. Yes, I want that one on, please. 12, 11. Ah, oh, yes, 10. I'd like that one as an output, please. Uh, 9, no. And 8. I'd like that as an output. So the ones with the digit 1 in are output. Now, running that is probably going to be you know, 10, 20 times faster than doing that. That's Arduino speak. Very friendly. You can see immediately what it's doing. This is extremely quick, but phew, you really have to look into what that's doing. And you count the bits backward, don't you? And think, oh, well, hang on, was that 12 or 11? Start again. Yeah, quick, but not so friendly to use. Mistakes can creep in. OK, here we have the loop. Same loop as what I had time, just running a big, long, well, this over here, as you can see. Every second, it's just counting up. Here's our overflow handler that we had last time, except this time I've got a slightly longer delay in it. And then we have two more uh, ISRs, one for comparator A and one for comparator B. And you can see the names reflect what they're doing. And all I've done is to say, I want a different delay in each. So I run these every so often, but at different rates otherwise all three leds will of course all flash at exactly the same time not very interesting so i've sort of you know d devised a method where I, whereby they flash at different rates simply by delaying how often they run but they set the pins exactly the same way as what we did in the first one so we can say of the pins that make up port b i want you to or the value of pin b0 in this case which is as it says over here d8 or pin uh, what we call in arduino land uh, GPI 08, which is physical pin 14, and ditto for that's the now the pin 13, and I've changed this one up here to uh, pin B2, which is D10. Oh, surely I must have written it. Oh, there we are, D10. Look, All right. So we're just toggling three pins at slightly different rates, even though the interrupt service routines themselves are all being pretty much triggered at the same time because it counts up to 255, doesn't it? 1,024 times, and it goes, oh, the value's the same now. I'm going to trigger each one of these independently. Now, we spoke just a minute ago, like, what happens to the loop? Well, once again, any one of these running will cause the loop to stop. The loop freezes. The interrupt service routines run at whatever rate, so the all three are running now. And then as each one of those interrupt routines finishes, it goes back to the loop continue. And if you look over here, it still looks like we're running yeah, pretty much every second because we couldn't possibly detect the minute delay that any one of these service routines is causing. But if you put a long running routine in there, you most certainly will see stutters on the main loop. And that could give you problems, as I say, with button presses or 
displays on an LCD screen or something like that. So keep the code in your interrupt service routines small, not least because that's best practice. But when you move over, as I say, to the ESP32 or ESP8266, you put a long running service routine there and the whole thing will just reboot after a certain time because it's a naughty thing to do. Yes, that, that's the technical explanation anyway. So there we have three different interrupt service routines all running from timer to an 8-bit timer. And uh, the only change we've made in this sketch is to say, yes, I want the comparator enabled for 2A and 2B. And the values I want you to compare against are these two values here. How you use that in your project? Well, I'll leave you to figure that out. But it's always good to know that you can do this. And basically, every so often, the interrupt routine will run totally independently from the loop. So you don't have to worry about calling stuff from the loop and all the rest of it. It's a hardware interrupt. Cool. Now, if there's time, I'd like to show you something about the ESP32 web radio, just, just two seconds worth. And I have a very, very important announcement to make. So all those people who have stopped watching this video before now are going to be, well, they'll be left in the dark, won't they? Right, big announcement. Well, for me, a big announcement. It looks like I really am going to move house this time, and it's going to happen um, probably very early January 2021. So if you're watching this video after January 2021, then things are probably back to normal, I hope. If you're watching this video pretty much as I make it sometime during December 2020 or very early 2021, then you'll wonder what's happened to me because I've not released any more videos. And the reason being is because I'm moving house. And obviously, right now, mid-December, I'm having to start packing up my house. And I'm hoping my workshop will stay functional for at least one more video before Christmas. But after that, I've got to pack everything in here into boxes, including my video cameras and microphones and everything else. So things will stop for a while. OK, but it doesn't mean my, my channel has stopped. It just means I'm pausing while I get a new workshop built at my new place and all this reset up. Yeah, I know. So that's just a heads up, really, that there'll probably be one more video before Christmas. And that's it. Cool. What else was I going to talk to you about? Oh, yes. The Internet Radio Project has finally come to fruition. Now, I'm going to have to move my camera that way so you can see it because I've got it on a different desk. Right. Over there on the other workbench, this bit over here, that was the original ESP32 radio. There's the screen still, right? All on the, on the um, breadboard. And that worked great. Occasionally, I've got a little glitch and things because these DuPont cables aren't really designed to you know, be a permanent connection. But as you can see, the radio is running over here. And it's connected via this sort of um, this uh, IDC cable from the back of this PCB that you see here to the one down here. And it's all connected. This is simply my serial port that I'm monitoring. And there's the VS1053 connected via a little tiny 10-way cable to the main motherboard. And there's the other end of the cable connected to the screen. Now, this is all running 100%, and I'm, I'm delighted with it. I've got to admit, I'm delighted. And the reason I designed it this way, to have the screen separate from the main motherboard, was so that this can be placed remotely, a little bit remotely anyway, from the main motherboard itself, right? So the reason I'm not going to cover this today is because I haven't got the box that this is going to go into, and I haven't quite finished it. And it doesn't look I'm going to finish that now, um, in time for Christmas. So next week we'll talk about something entirely different. Um, but I do hope to put all this into a case very nicely and it'll probably cost more than all the rest of this put together, as it always does, doesn't it? Enclosures and stuff. And it's been running continuously for about, uh, must be this must be the third or fourth day. Not a single glitch, absolutely rock solid. So those people who've made, made comments about the ESP32 web radio, and they're going, top of the list is reliability. This now is reliable because all these connections on here, of course, are, well, they're solid, aren't they? They're not done by DuPont cables. So full details of all this will be, you know, put up on my GitHub in due course, not just yet because I'm waiting for the enclosure, as I say. But at least you've had a little update and I've not forgotten about it. OK, before the entire workbench over there collapses, <laughs> I love your comments about the uses for the timer to interrupt. 
Um, I don't know what you could use those for. As I say, I tried to use it on the ESP32. It's all falling apart. Um, and that was the wrong approach. If you can think of a right approach where you might use time it interrupts, go ahead and put it down in your comments and anything else you want to know about this, this particular topic. And I'll see you one more time, one more time, before Christmas. And that's it for several weeks thereafter. Great. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.